Daniel? Yeah, I know people are outside. Good. So that's all we have. So if I may ask you to come a bit to the front, because uh, the room looks a little bit funny the way it is right now. So if you don't mind, come to the front. And... Uh, So when we ran this subject, um, the last time was 11 years ago, in 2009. And um, in uh, the Victorian Parliament, it was following a, following a debate on the two-state solution and uh, the burgeoning BDS at the time. And everything was super cool and calm. And the moment we started with this subject of climate change, Literally, people were, were at each other's throat. So there is nothing new, therefore, that this debate does bring in um, a lot of emotional, a lot of emotions. Uh, so let's begin. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, the professors and the doctors on this panel. I'll start with Moshe, uh, just simply to introduce yourself and what you do. Uh, so I'm uh, the co-founder and director of uh, the Institute for Environmental Security and Wellbeing Studies, the first kind of uh, its institute in, in Israel, and I'm dealing uh, for the last 10 years or more with climate change, environmental security in the Middle East, Africa, the developing world, uh, also the Arctic, the Antarctic, uh, everywhere. Very good. Pinchas? Uh, I'm an atmospheric scientist. I did my PhD at the Hebrew University, and uh, then my postdoc at Harvard. And then I served as the head of the Porter School for Environmental Studies in Tel Aviv University, and the head of the Department of Geophysics. And uh, in the last uh, 40 years or so, I'm dealing with climate changes uh, in Israel, in the Mediterranean, and in the world, but with focus over this region. And I noticed with interest that you talk about climate, climate changes in the plural. You'll have to explain that a bit later. Nir Shaviv? Um, I'm a professor of physics. Uh, I study uh, mostly astrophysics. I also study uh, the effects that the sun has uh, on climate. Uh, I just finished being the chair of my department, so I'm now a free person. I was also the head of the uh, professors' uh, faculty union, uh, like in all of Israel, the head of all the... Uh, so I'm a unionist. No, I'm just kidding. Um, anyway, uh, that's my background. Very good. And, and Yoni? Oh, no. Yeah, Yoni, please. I'm a professor of chemistry at, uh, at Ben Gurion University. Um, I'm not a climate scientist, but I have been working in industry for some time uh, before I returned to academia in the field of solar panels and green energy and so forth. And in the last few years, I've been reading and discussing these issues in, in various aspects. And as I will comment, there are various aspects, not only related to atmospheric sciences in this debate. OK, so, so as I said this morning, I'm the innocent bystander here. So I'm going to ask very basic questions because part of the reason I, I do this dialogue, of course, is that I'm extremely curious and uh, there's too much that I don't understand and I want to learn. And so one of the questions I have, which cannot be found in any literature, in any uh, uh, serious newspaper, because they all present things as so finite, you know, you know things are the way they are, um, and, uh, and you have to take it or leave it. But I would like to ask you, has this battle on whether the climate is changing, has that been settled in the scientific community? Is the climate changing? Can I ask you, uh, Moshe, to start answering that? Uh, yes, I can start answering that uh, from the Arab world point of view give you another point of view that you never are hearing of. <laughs> so the Arabs are 
going to have, for the first time ever, next year in Dubai, uh, the first climate week uh, in, the, in the MENA history. MENA is the Middle East and North Africa. So the issue of climate change in the Arab world is really also a scientific issue that really is taught more and more in Arab universities, in Arab schools, in uh, all over the Arab world. And now, uh, also, what it means is that uh, climate change is part of the national security of states in the Arab world. And if we don't understand that, we miss a lot in understanding the Arab world today. And I can give a few examples, uh, if I may. Uh, for example, Syria. The civil war in Syria started because of climate refugees, uh, because of a huge drought that started in uh, 2006 and uh, continued until 2011 and more. And uh, then uh, people were uh, out of their elements, meaning uh, they couldn't really herd, uh, they couldn't really everything, all the water wells were uh, dried, so they needed to move. And this means million and a half people needed to move. Uh, and then uh, it created a lot of fr frustration against the regime. And then what happened is uh, the rebellion. It started on those, on those uh, peripheries of Dara in the border with Israel and in the north uh, east side of Syria. Another example, Darfur. Darfur, the genocide in Darfur started because the desert was uh, progressing 40 kilometers in 100 years. And then the Arabs descended on the black agriculturalists and just murder them in the fight over, over natural resources. So this is the kind of, of, this is what is climate change in the Middle East. A cause for a real trouble, a cause of really collapse of regimes, a cause for a, a lot of frustration against regimes, and it continues to be so. Yes, but my question is whether the scientific community has agreed the on... World, yes. But because you are talking about microclimates here, you're talking about certain phenomena that can be happening totally by chance that are cyclical and so on. Yes. You're talking about a measurement of science as to whether you guys all agree there is no doubt climate is changing and here are the reasons. The what you've, given, you've given me some political things and so on. But I I'm, I'm, I'm have to say, I am not more knowledgeable now that I've heard your answer. Professor Pinchas. I was asked to give something about the Sufganiya <laughs> before I start, by Paul Israel. Uh, I told him that it's called Sufganiya because it absorbs a lot of oil and there is a lot of sugar in it, and white flour. I don't touch it for the last 10 years, only to do the mitzvah on the first evening. In a week from now, exactly, I will take a little bit to make the mitzvah. So this is enough, perhaps, for Paul. Where is he? He's, he's somewhere here. Okay. Now to your question, <laughs> Albert. Uh, Daniel had difficult time to bring here climate scientists because they, got, they gave him several reasons. And two or three of the famous climate scientists in Israel told him the debate is over. That means there is no really a debate about the changing of the climate. If you ask me if climate is changing, uh, this, this is, this is uh, the common opinion between scientists, atmospheric scientists, is the debate is over, particularly in the recent decades. 
as we saw dramatic changes, particularly in, in this region, but not only in this region, all over the world, including the Arctic, the sea ice is disappearing, including the, the rise of the temperature. Five of the most warm years that we had in the recorded data was in recent years, just in recent five, ten years. In fact, I was not sure, I had had many debates with Neil in the past, and we are going to have more in the future, I guess. We are still friends. <laughs> and we are still friends, uh, perhaps even good friends, because I like the skeptics. I think the skeptics is the basic of science. And there are questions. And people like Nir, he will present them, I guess, I bring, are bringing the, the community to learn more of the basic questions that sometimes are being ignored. So the answer to a question, yes, to my opinion, the climate is changing dramatically in recent decades. And uh, if somebody called me an alarmist, I don't call myself as an alarmist, but, uh, but I think we should worry, and I am worried. Very good. Nir Shaviv. Uh, so the short answer to your question is yes, uh, the climate is changing. Um, it has uh, been changing uh, since uh, forever. Uh, a thousand years ago, for example, it was uh, roughly as warm as it is today. Uh, Five thousand years ago, it was uh, warmer by several degrees than what it is today. So there are, of course, other things which are uh, affecting the climate. And uh, one of them, the thing that uh, I work on, is uh, the role that the sun uh, has played. And uh, I can show you that there's uh, very clear evidence, as clear as the light of day, that uh, the sun has contributed about uh, at least uh, half the warming over the 20th century. Um, but it's ignored. It's ignored by the climate community. And the main reason it's uh, ignored is because if you ignore it, uh, sorry, if you don't ignore it, then you have to realize that in order to understand what has been going on over the 20th century, you have to realize that uh, climate sensitivity is uh, relatively low. Because if there are a lot of things which have contributed towards the warming, uh, then you need a climate which is uh, not very sensitive. And if it's not very sensitive, it means that uh, the future warming is uh, not as uh, bleak it's uh, often uh, portrayed, um, and some people don't like uh, the uh, unbleakness of uh, the future. Um, so, um, I mean, I should emphasize... So the answer is yes, the climate is changing. Yes, it is. Okay. So, because I've got so many questions. Okay. So, <laughs> no, so uh, I will answer Goodbye. briefly. Um, so I'm quoting Richard Lindzen from MIT who said uh, uh, in one of his YouTubes, climate is always changing. So I think the debate is not whether or not climate is changing, but whether or not, uh, uh, I mean, there are three other questions which are far more important. The first is, uh, is it us? Is it changing because of us? That was going to be my next okay. question. So, so, I'm, so, I'm right. so can we go step by step? Because okay. we, we, we so, need to so do it on I, the basic step. I would say that the majority... And let me interrupt you here. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to say why I want to do this okay. in, a, in a basic way. But you will let me finish my remark at the end. But you've already gone too complex. I'll okay. tell you why. Okay, fair enough. Because, you see, one of the reasons I wanted to have this debate here today... Was, is because I've got the impression that there is a whole uh, cohort of people out there that are scaring children, that are scaring teenagers. I think that the psychological damage that is being created is far too great. I cannot agree and, more. And I would like this se session to be... With all due respect, let's not use big words. Let's use yeah. very uh, ideas that can be comprehended because I'd like this to be an educational right. um, uh, a podcast that so, can be uh, so, given to so those I will answer 
um, to your question directly, I think there is no real argument that the temperatures, the global average temperature, to the extent that it has any meaning, has risen by about one and something degrees in the last 120 years. There is absolutely no agreement, according to the IPCC itself, about whether this is accompanied by uh, various changes in various meteorological effects. What is the IPCC? The International Panel for Climate Change. This is the body that the UN has uh, um, assigned to investigate the effect of man on climate change. This is in their charter. They're, cha they're checking, is man affecting climate change? So the answer of the, the, their answer is that in terms of temperature, probably, in terms of meteorological uh, uh, um, phenomena, unclear, which means in the language of lawyers, there is no statistical evidence for that. Okay, so... Oh, but I, I wanted one, one more point because... Go ahead. Okay, sorry, because um, uh, um, Syria was mentioned here, and, and there was indeed a draft in Syria, and it was indeed related to the last crisis. But if you look at the statistics of drafts in Syria, for the past 100 years, and this has been monitored by the British since, the, and since they colonized the, the Arab world, um, you see no change in the statistics of drought. So it, there was a drought, but it, it's not due to global climate change. It's just part of the weather in Syria. And that's statistically meaningless. Okay, very good. So now for the next question, which you, uh, you, you took it out of my mouth before, is, is this uh, a change in temperature in climate that we are observing, given that everybody agrees that there is a, a climate that is evolving or changing, um, is this due to mankind in, in whole? In part, please, Moshe. It's hard to know. I mean, uh, both. Uh, I will give you again the perspective of the Arab world. It's, it's not known whether it is because of human, because of human deeds or because of the climate itself. It's not known. Uh, there is an agreement that there is climate change. Uh, the, the really temperature soared. 50 degrees Celsius or more in the Arabian Peninsula, but uh, also in Israel it was uh, very significantly, but no one knows really whether it is because of human deeds or uh, just climate itself. Do you agree with that, Pinhas? No, absolutely not. I suggest that Moshe move to the second table. <laughs> uh, you mentioned Professor Linsen. He was my supervisor during my postdoc. He's one of the very famous and very well-known dynamicists in the world. And uh, I had many, many arguments with him. And he gradually, he will not agree with me, but he gradually changed his mind, like Nir did, and giving more and more part to the anthropogenic activity. Let me bring you one fact which is amazing. Professor Paul Krutzen, who is a Nobel Prize winner, about the ozone hole, is environmental uh, scientist, very well known. And I had the opportunity to talk with him um, uh, several times. He suggested to call this new period, the last starting from 100 or 150 years ago, to call it Anthropocene. That means a new era in the history of the climate, that the climate is dictated by the human being. Now, it's very, very difficult for many people to accept it. But it is based on so many studies. And the IPCC is the 
intergovernmental panel on climate change is very clear about its conclusions on this. They call it not likely, but most likely, even higher, about the anthropogenic effect. So, we are in a new era that didn't exist in the climate of the atmosphere ever. The humans are changing the climate. And Yer Shaviv? Um, it's actually, um, okay, so if you look at the um, evidence that uh, CO2 has a large effect on climate, uh, you will find that uh, there is no firm evidence uh, that it has a large effect. Um, if you open the IPCC reports uh, themselves, uh, they tell you from the first report in 1990 until uh, recently that if you double the amount of CO2, you will increase the temperature anywhere between one and a half and four and a half uh, degrees, uh, which is a factor of three uncertainty. And with this uncertainty, you cannot uh, explain... Uh, Any one conversation, please. Thank you. you cannot explain uh, ab initio um, and reach the necessary conclusion that most of the warming over the 20th century is necessarily anthropogenic. Um, and in fact, there is a range of evidence showing you that CO2 doesn't have a large effect on climate. Uh, on uh, geological timescales, we have had uh, variations which are uh, a factor of tenfold uh, variations in the CO2 level, which uh, have absolutely no effect uh, on the temperature. There's no correlation between CO2 and temperature on geological timescales. So you can actually place an upper limit that if you double the amount of CO2, you uh, cannot increase the temperature by more than one and a half uh, degrees, uh, which is just below this uh, range uh, quoted by the IPCC. So just looking at the IPCC reports themselves, you cannot reach the conclusion that most of the warming is necessarily anthropogenic. And in fact, the, in, the evidence that the IPCC uses is only indirect evidence, um, namely that uh, supposedly the temperature increase uh, that we have witnessed is unique, and if it's unique, it's mostly uh, anthropogenic. And the second argument is that you don't have anything else to explain the warming with, and as, as a consequence, it must be humans. Uh, this argument itself is also faulty because we have something else to explain, a large part of the warming. Okay, and yourself? Yes, so, so this, this is a, a logical... Uh, statement in terms of scientific logic, in order to say this is because of that, you need to say something like, I know why this happens. It is not because of other things. Now, climate is a complicated thing, and it has changed in the past. There is essentially nothing very special about the last 50 years of warming. It happened more or less at the same rate at the beginning of the 20th century, with essentially no increase in CO2. So there is precedent for this kind of rise. In fact, for the temperatures that we have, there are several precedents in terms of, uh, of temperature proxies that have been uh, um, evaluated past temperatures. And you see temperatures essentially as high as now, or even higher in, in the medieval times, around 1200 uh, uh, AC, and probably around zero uh, a year zero or as high as now. So there's nothing really special about temperature being as high as they are now. There's nothing really special about uh, the rate of change of temperature now. So one has to say in order to, to, to attribute the recent change to, to humans, you have to say we know why uh, the temperature rose at the beginning of the 20th century and this is not happening now. And neither of these statements are correct. No one knows really why the temperatures rose at the beginning of the 20th century. And, and ergo, you cannot say that these conditions are not present now. So are we contributing to the uh, a rise in temperature? Maybe. But there is no clear evidence for that. And definitely one cannot attribute a given number to that. This is why in the IPCC reports, the, the uh, attribution is spread. It could be any number between one degrees and five degrees, and any number in between, and we just don't know. So, there is no agreement as to why this is happening, it seems. And, but is it totally incompatible for those who believe that it's man-made, 
that they can also see that there is a cycle. I mean, we, we live in the atmosphere of the sun after all. And what I'm curious about is how those models work. I mean, um, surely if, for instance, let's say you and I have the same model, and uh, uh, I believe that the atmosphere of the sun um, plays a role that is 50%. Uh, you believe that it's 20%, automatically we're going to be getting some different results because the variable determines the outcome. The most difficult thing in those models, and I know because I did financial models and it's very similar, uh, how do you determine what the variables are? And how do you do it as a scientific? I would like you to answer this because he doesn't believe that. I see. <laughs> you, you are the only one that I can ask the question to. Okay. I, perhaps I'm the only one here who built his own model, atmospheric model from scratch in my PhD. It was very difficult, but it's very simple. In, the basic idea is simple. You solve seven different equations with seven variables, and the solution is not simple. It, takes, it can take thousands, perhaps 10,000 of lines, coding lines in, in uh, computer language. i tell you something. I think the most basic problem of people who are skeptic is because they don't believe that the models can do the work. And this is the main, the main basic of your question. No, no, no. no. The basics of my question is as follows. Uh, in the financial world, we know that the more variable and the less predictability. That's true on all financial market. If you want to get to a model that is predictable, you reduce the variables. You don't increase them. That's the first thing. The second one, you work from a set of data. When you work from a set of data, you work with the past, and therefore you curve feet, and that never predicts the future. So those are mathematical, logical arguments, and they require answers, because, because the public isn't, people aren't idiots. And unfortunately, uh, one professor before talked about the averages, and the averages are really misleading. Let, let me tell you something about what I, I want to explain about the models. Uh, Professor Linsen mentioned before, MIT, Linsen, in Harvard, I was studying with him for two years. He said, he said to me, what if the model, and Nir also has it on one of his slides, so what if the model is working? to produce the changing of the temperature in the 20th century. You turn this knob and you turn this knob and this comes to your point. With different variables, you can bring it to work. The fact is, it's partly true. In fact, when I was suggested to do my PhD, building a model to explain the storms the stormy wind in the Kinneret, the Lake Kinneret, during each summer day, when you go there at around noontime, if you arrive at 12, the Lake Kinneret is like a mirror. And then at 1.30, like, like on the, the clock, at 1.30 to 2, it becomes stormy, and they have to start working, the police there, to, to rescue the people who are in the, in the lake in Earth, which becomes so way with, with a lot of waves. When I was given this exercise by my supervisor, Professor Neumann, who was the head of the department at the Hebrew University, I really was skeptic. I did not believe that a model, I was talking like you, I was thinking like you. I didn't believe that a model is able to generate this wind which, which starts in the Mediterranean 
and then drops into the lake Kinneret and causes these storms. But once I did it, and I saw that it works, not only works, it worked so nicely, giving the time when the sea breeze from the Mediterranean arrives and drops with a high intensity into the lake Kinneret every day. Then I realized the power of the model. I told it also to Linsen because he didn't, he didn't really believe that when I presented it as a seminar at Harvard. I think this is the basic problem of many people because models are something that you don't believe in it. You can do whatever you want with the models. But models do work and they explain so much. Let me give you one simple example. When I started working on global warming, I noticed, it was 30, 40 years ago, that precipitation is predicted to drop all over the Mediterranean, including Israel but not in the south of Israel. In the south of Israel, many of the models show increases of rainfall. And this was 35 years ago. And the re most recent models, they show again the same result. So there is a lot of power in the models which you cannot believe unless you are engaged with. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Nia Sheviv? Uh, I have several problems with the climate models. Uh, one of them is that, I mean, um, because we don't know, that, I mean, there's some of the physics that we don't know, and it's basically parameterized, and that's uh, one of the reasons why the IPCC uh, still thinks that the climate sensitivity should be anywhere between one and a half to four and a half uh, degrees. Um, and uh, this uh, piece of physics, which is uh, not very well understood, is uh, how clouds uh, react. Um, basically, the models include the cloud cover as a recipe by how much the clouds are going to change if we uh, increase the temperature by a given amount or the humidity and so forth. And the, the climate models give a sensitivity to CO2 or other changes in the energy budget, which can range and give you whatever you want according to the recipe that you choose. So basically, these kind of uh, climate models work in the, what we call in computers a uh, GIGO. It's uh, garbage in, garbage out. Um, that's one problem I have with the climate models. Uh, you can see that the climate models don't work uh, very well if you look at how much the temperature has increased over the past several decades um, in the mid-tropical uh, uh, troposphere, uh, which is where you would expect there to be a relatively high increase in the temperature. If the climates are relatively sensitive, there would be a feedback to water vapor, and the, the mid-troposphere should increase by relatively a lot. And you don't see this warming in the models. You, uh, if you look at radio sound or sat satellite data, you don't see it. So the models are missing a very big uh, uh, fingerprint of, of a high climate sensitivity. They show you that the climate should be on the low side. And the last thing that I have a problem with, with the climate models is the fact that we can see, we can quantify the effect that the sun has on climate. Uh, every 11 years, the sun changes its uh, magnetic uh, polarity. And uh, over this 11-year solar cycle, we can see huge amount of energy going in and out of the, the world oceans. We can see that over the past uh, century. And the climate models are simply ignoring this large uh, elephant in the room. So, as I said, I'm not a climate scientist, but I am a theoretical physicist. In the last 15 years, I've been uh, conjuring uh, theoretical models and comparing them to experiments. So I have no doubt that some models work. 
And the way the methodology works is that you make a model and you look at its predictions and, and it's what it gives you and you compare that to reality. And there are many, many methodological, methodological problems in, in climate models which are very easily noticed by someone who's doing models. Just for example, the fact that you're averaging over parameterizations and things like that. But really the fact that you see things in models which are not in reality. For example, the number of, of uh, intertropical convergence zones or a wrong gradient to, uh, across the oceans or, or the, the, the temperature uh, along the height in the tropics. But really uh, what caught, catches my eye most strongly is the fact that we all see these uh, models and how they give you the exact temperature change, but what we don't see is what is the temperature that they're giving you. And there's a reason for that. And the reason is that the temperature that they're giving you is wrong. Different models can vary in plus to minus three degrees centigrade from the average temperature that has been measured. So the, the absolute prediction is wrong, but the prediction of the change is correct. This is simply a, a, a wrong in terms of space data to study exactly how the weather is changing from day to day till 2100. So the data is available in every level going from the surface to the upper atmosphere. I did not say the data is not available, I just said it does not fit reality. <laughs> it's model data out there, I, I definitely agree. You can take the model and play with it, that, that's what this many people do. True. This is simply not true. So are you able to measure on the day-to-day -day and say, well, this model has predicted that in Tel Aviv it's going to be 21 degrees and it's 21 degrees? Is that what you're saying? What I'm saying is that we started in recent 10, 15 years analyzing the day-to-day -day changes in these 20, not all the 20 models, we took the 15 best models and by the way, these are very good groups. You are talking about parameterization. The best groups, climate groups in the world. I have no doubt that top scientists are working on this. I have a problem with the methodology, okay. not with the scientists. I'm explaining what is the process that for people to understand. Each group, each climate group, we don't have such a group in Israel because it is a lot of effort. I would like to establish one. Uh, and a lot of money, but each of the groups no doubt, a lot is of money. trying to perform the best, and they are choosing the best parameterization they can choose for each of the processes, the, cli the cloud, the turbulence in the boundary layer, and the interaction of aerosols. Each one has its own parameterization, and the amazing thing is that they all show that increasing of the greenhouse gases, not only CO2, the all greenhouse gases, the methane is important, and the feedback with water vapor is doubling the, the warming. And they all, they, I am not surprised that it's 1.5 to 4.5, but they all show the same a direction, and do you want to take the risk that they all agree that it's going to be much warmer than today, and all what could come along with it? Okay, Michael. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm not a scientist, but I've been to Greenland, and I've seen the effects of the melting of the ice cap. I know that um, the Northwest Passage, there used to be two vessels a year could get through. There are now 250 ships a year going through the Northwest Passage. Um, I've been, when I was a young man, I was a teacher in Swaziland in Southern Africa, and I visited the Victoria Falls, which was a most magnificent waterfall. I saw a television program this week. There is no water in the Victoria Falls because the rivers um, the Zambezi has dried up. Now, I know because I, in my time in Africa, there were rivers that dried up. 
And then the rains came and there were seasonal rivers, but not the Victoria Falls. And if you talk to people in Iceland, which is an interesting country because of the volcanic uh, uh, heating of their, of, of their uh, and they will be completely um, carbon neutral because they take the water from, the, from below the volcanoes. They have got a research project there which is looking at fish stocks and the acidity of the water and the temperatures of the waters caused by the melting of the ice, moving the fish from one area to the other. Certain types of fish can thrive in certain types of waters, others thrive elsewhere. That is a massive consequence for coastal communities and so on. The Gulf Stream, which comes across the Atlantic, which means that the UK has temperate climates, and that our winters are not supposed to be as cold as Sweden's, the Gulf Stream could be diverted. That will change a whole range of things. We talked about the movement of people that are caused by um, droughts in Africa and uh, refugee movements. Now, whether it, the human contribution to this is 10%, 20%, 50%, 70%, I don't really care. I know that changes are happening and we have got to mitigate those changes. And our parliament has unanimously voted that there is a, a climate emergency. Now, I don't, I don't believe that this is the end of the world. And this, you made reference to the millennialism and misleading young people. I understand that argument because we had the debate in the 1980s about nuclear war and nuclear winter and global extinction and so on. People can get into that mindset, but the reality is whole countries, including Bangladesh uh, and others with coastal communities, cities built on the floodplain, like London, uh, if there is a rise in sea levels, because of melting ice and, and changes in the balance, tens, hundreds of millions of people will have to move or we will have to build cities in different ways. So we've got to do things about this to mitigate the damage. And I think the climate change denialists put all of us at great risk. We, we, we've got to be measured about doing this. We've got to use technology, but the climate change denialists actually are a real threat to hundreds of millions of people. Right. Can I, can I answer? Absolutely. Quite quickly, thank you for this uh, comment. I'm not sure there was a question there. But it took me... Um, so last week there was, of course, an item in the news, in the Israeli news, in all of them, actually, about the, the drying of the Victoria Falls, and that's a horrific sight. So it took me about five minutes to go into Google Scholar and actually look at the rain regime and, and droughts in Zambia, in the region of Victoria Lake and the great Victoria Falls, and you see it right in front of you. There's nothing new under the sun. There's just nothing special about the Victoria Falls being dry every few years. This is just cyclic weather. It happens. And essentially, every, everything... Um, A century ago, it was completely dry. 2008... 1992, there was barely a drizzle, same in, 18, in 1987. You can just look at it yourself. It's available in Google Scholar. Um, um, there's a feeling of, of climate change. But humans have extremely short memories. I can testify it upon myself, but I think it's, it's, it's common to many of us. This is why we have statistics. And this is why we have science, to actually check it against our feelings. And the fact is that there's nothing special about the Victoria Falls running dry. There is nothing special about a, a water rising in about one to two millimeters a year. This has been happening since the 1880s, long before we've started to burn fossil fuels. 
There is nothing special about the current droughts in Australia, quite hard to imagine, but I actually have the data with me. I wasn't sure what to expect today, so I brought some papers with me. <laughs> There's nothing special about those. It's hard to believe because we hear it all the time that the world is burning and that it's collapsing under our feet. But honestly, look at the data. You see that the statistics don't lie. There's nothing very special about that. So if you want to have action in light of these statistics, you're going to make a lot of damage, sir because you're going to take money where it should go and put it in places where statistics say it shouldn't go. Here. Uh, Marsha Thompson has a question. Thank you, uh, Elbert. Um, given that 97% of climate scientists believe man is contributing to climate change and the increase, as a person who is not a scientist, I'm not pretending here I am a scientist, I am not, but... But we do have to, as governments do, to consider what that means. And I am a person who likes to believe in science. And I was fortunate enough to be able to participate in a climate change um, session at Parliament House in Victoria in the early 2000s, where we brought in a number of climate change specialists from Australia and, and Melbourne to talk to us about climate change. And the one professor that I spent quite a lot of time talking to who convinced me of this argument, he said the sun is contributing to climate change. He's not denying that it isn't. He's saying it is. But he says over the last century and particularly in the last 50 years, man has contributed more to the changing climate and will continue to do so unless we do something about it. So instead of having an either-or fight about this, if there is within the science world some consensus around, and 97% is a pretty good consensus, around the notion that, yes, the sun is contributing, but man is contributing more, then surely man has a responsibility to take action to ensure it doesn't increase uh, beyond the realms that we can deal with. Because the truth is, governments are now looking at how suburbs are going to have to be planned in the future. I read my own newspapers at home this morning and my own suburb where I live is now going to be prone to flooding because of climate change. I'm now wondering what I need to do in my own suburb. But, but one second, please. Uh, Donnie, one second. I wish I had a waterfront house. One second, please, Donnie. So, so I, just, I just think that this has gotten very political and very heated, but I would like you, yes, Albert... I'm, I'm, try, I'm trying to calm it down. No, and I'm just going to say, Albert... Because Albert's, a panic will not get us anywhere. And I think, Albert, that what I want to commend you for, Albert, is that we actually talk about the science. And for me, the science indicates that the man, man is responsible for the majority of global warming and we should be taking action. So I, I, if you don't mind, I'm, I would like to just raise a couple of points on what you said, uh, Masha. First of all, at the time of Galileo, the consensus was that the Earth was flat. Uh, now, science is not a democracy. And one person could be right, and everyone else could be wrong. Let's agree to that. Even 100% no, of the people can be wrong. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so, so the facts basically don't care about whether uh, you agree or not. Uh, so uh, so uh, we are here to try to discover what is it that makes this whole thing tick. And uh, quite frankly, there's so much politics in this that I just don't believe that number of 97%. If you are able to prove to me that there are 97%, show it to me. Nobody is able to do that. Tony. No, no, peers actually, Albert. Peers, peers. Sorry. Albert, uh, I think 98% uh, of statistics are wrong uh, in, the, in the first place. Um, second, um, the Zambezi River Authority publishes daily data flow on its website. Uh, they're taken at Victoria Falls, which are magnificent. And according to the, the data I've just been able to Google, the latest flows uh, uh, this, this week, or sorry, this month, uh, from December 2, in, say that the water flow has actually increased, um, closing at 227 cubic metres per second, slightly higher than the reading on the same date last year. Um, Thank now, God. This is empirical data, of course, 
Um, and, and the third point, my final point, is that I, I've sailed twice across the Pacific and visited a number of islands on the way. I was in the Miek Archipelago uh, this time last week uh, in the Bay of Bengal. Every island I ever visit, I ask if it's inhabited. I ask the locals, has the water increased? Uh, has the water, water, the sea level increased? Across the Pacific, and particularly in Kiribati, which is one of the go-to uh, nations for the IPCC, um, the land mass above sea level has actually increased uh, over the years that I've been visiting it. And in the Miek Archipelago, the fishermen I spoke with looked absolutely blank because uh, they say they're not using longer lines. The water level is exactly the same as it was when their grandfathers taught them how to fish. Thank you. So yes, but I'm not sure that the anecdotal evidence of you or, or of, of that kind or the one we heard before, I still don't know if that's scientific because it's only observational. And uh, I'm trying to get back to the science. We all, uh, I mean, I hear so much uh, people talk about the science as if the religion. Is it a religion we're talking about here? So if let me tell you, uh, let me remind you of Karl Popper's definition of science. Do you remember? all what Karl Popper said, 1937 or 36? Okay, what is scientific is that what is open for falsification. If you are unable to open up, then it's not scientific. So is it religion? Religion is totally closed. You cannot falsify a religion. You will not convince someone who believes in God that God doesn't exist. But you are able scientifically to open up and rerun the experiment and find the fault. And the, criticis the cri criticizing of the science is what makes science. The moment we stop doing that, well, we're back into the Middle Ages. So let's be open. And I don't want to prejudge of the of the outcome. First of all, we're not going to find the outcome here today, but I just want to uh, give people a sense about what's required to actually be inquisitive again and not just go with those uh, little kids that uh, are panicking and uh, putting makeup and, I mean, seriously. So, uh, Nirshavi, if you wanted to, to answer. Uh, yes, first of all, I'm really happy that uh, you want to discuss the science uh, because I think this is something that uh, the climate, uh, all the climate change issue, uh, I mean, basically left the realm of science. Uh, it's very hard to have a decent scientific conversation with the present uh, a atmosphere when you are being called a, a denialist, for example. A denial uh, is a, some kind of a I think a derogatory word that should not be used. Uh, I'm skeptic. Uh, as a scientist, I'm supposed to be skeptical of everything until I see the data. Now, um, as for the science itself, uh, you say that you were told by a scientist that the sun is being taken into account. Uh, that's wrong. Uh, what is being taken into account are just changes in the total irradiance that the sun uh, has, the, changes, the small changes in the luminosity of the sun, uh, which are uh, typically an order of magnitude less than what you see going in and out of the oceans every 11-year solar cycle. And if you don't take the real effect that the sun has uh, into account, you reach the wrong conclusion. So uh, the way I see it, uh, there's a as I said, there's an elephant in the room which is totally uh, ignored by the climate uh, community. And uh, um, if you wish to continue to ignore it, then, um, then you will remain with the wrong conclusions. I want to answer. Please. <clears throat> the solar activity, as another explanation, was refuted from several directions. Uh, first of all, solar forcing cannot explain the 20th century observation. It causes stratosphere to warm faster than the surface. No, it doesn't. While the stratosphere is cooling. The stratosphere is cooling. Also, we have direct satellite observation of solar irradiance 
since 1980, and it is overall decreased. And during that time, when warming occurs. Now, this is the time when warming was the steepest. And third, the ionized particles are too small to be effective cloud condensation. And the CERN experiment that were done on clouds they show that cosmic rays are not significant. And the, f the last point is that cosmic rays are dominated by the 11-year cycle, and they are not seen in the global temperature. The answer, your answer, in one of the papers regarding the ocean effect was also does not answer the problem. This is the points. Now I want to answer Marsh and... Can I answer, can I address the criticisms? If we go to the solar... Okay. okay. Uh, first of all, the fact that uh, the sun supposedly hits the stratosphere, uh, this is if you assume that the effect is mostly through UV, um, and it's not, it's through cloud cover. We see the cloud cover change together with uh, the solar cycle, um, and we can, uh, and the effects are mostly in the lower uh, uh, troposphere. The second point is, uh, you said that uh, solar activity has decreased, and indeed it decreased uh, from the 1990s. Uh, I never said that the sun effect uh, explains all the warming. Uh, humans have contributed towards the warming. And if you build a model which takes both into account, you realize that about half the warming is uh, solar and half is uh, anthropogenic. However, the claim that you cannot explain the warming because uh, it decreased is akin to saying that the sun doesn't warm us because between, say, noon and 2 p.m., the temperature is increasing, but the solar irradiance that we get is decreasing. That's because of the heat capacity. And the same thing goes for the 11-year solar cycle. The reason it's very hard to see a temperature change over the 11-year solar cycle is because the ocean's uh, heat capacity. But here is a graph that shows you the sea level change together with the solar activity. And you see that every time the sun is more active, the sea levels are rising. And on short time scales, it's because of thermal expansion. So this is 10 times more than what, uh, a other, uh, what say, mainstream climatologists are willing to, to admit the, the effect that the sun has. And again, if you exclude that, you get the wrong conclusions. And the, the fact that the stratosphere is uh, cooling is actually a signature of the CO2, but it shows you what the effect is on the radiation budget. It doesn't tell you anything about what the net uh, change on the temperature is. I hope you record this statement from Nir Shaviv, that half is anthropogenic. I have been saying exactly the same thing since 2004. Well noted. Well noted. Since 2004, I've been saying exactly the same thing. Uh, you wanted to make a second point, okay. or shall I go to the next question? The second relates to the comment on Victoria. I am not, I'm not going to comment on Victoria, but I am going to comment on something that for Israelis is in the heart. Uh, and this is what is happening in the Mediterranean and the Middle East. It started with a comment by Moshe, on the climate immigrants from Russia, from Syria, from Iraq. Climate immigrants. We were the first to point out about 14 years ago, it was published in January 2008, that the Fertile Crescent is going to disappear at the end of this century. This was based on a climate model which was the most, the best resolution ever run, together with a very strong group in Tokyo, Japanese group, so we published this paper that shows that the Uferetes and the whole region of the Fertile Crescent is going to dry out at the end of this century. But when I published this paper 13 years ago, I never imagined that it's going to have such a dramatic increase in the dryness in the following decade. 
So the last decade and a half, and there is a, several studies, there is still a debate going on about if the climate immigrants and what happened in Syria and Iraq is due to global warming, but n all studies agree that there is a contribution by global warming, and there is another contribution by local activities, for example, stop of irrigation and destroying of all activities by the bombing that went on. So the Columbia University paper, which, was, which is very much cited, has made this relation between the climate, the global warming, and tried to separate the global warming effect and the local contributions by irrigation and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And they are conclusive that the effect of global warming on the drying of the of the fertile crescent and of the climate of the war uh, the the wars that developed and they cited my paper, of course. I was very happy about it. But this is main conclusion by several studies. There are studies that say that the main contributor is the local effects. And another thing is the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean was shown by many, many groups dealing with climate studies the Mediterranean is the hot spot in the world. Most of the models agree that the Mediterranean is going to suffer most of all. About drying, precipitation going down, and temperatures going up at a rate which is unprecedented at the subtropical zones. Because at the Arctic and the Antarctic, we have very dramatic increases of temperatures, which are the highest in the world. Do you have a time frame for that? You can, the time frame is given in the IPCC. You mean for the drying of the fertile so, crescent? Yes, no, no, for, for the Mediterranean to uh, temperatures to go up in the way you described. How much longer are we going to live? <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is something that I think is working in support of the skeptics. Because the alarmists are sometimes, I, there are two groups which cause a problem to, to the real things which are troubling a lot. The one group is the group of alarmists who are saying the world is going to end. This is not a situation. And the other group is the group of uh, skeptics. It's like in politics, it's always the like extremes. in politics that both of the sides of the extremes are, are disturbing, are most worrying for me as a climate scientist studying in the last 40 years what's happening in the atmosphere. And it's really worrying. But going with dramatic announcements of the world is going to end and so on, this is not what I am, it, it's, it's only doing a lot of damage so to professor, the whole thing. To go back to your model and prediction, does your prediction have a, a, a date or not? A date for, yes. We just published recently, a few months ago, analysis of all the data in Israel after homogenization, which was not done before. Homogenization means correcting for different, a change of the location of the station, a change of uh, trees around it, etc., etc., and it was shown very, very clearly. Wait, but you cannot tell me. 60, 60 stations in Israel, that the temperature, and the temperature is now uh, exceeding in a rate that we never had. Point a double of the rate, if we take from 1950 till 2017, which is about 0.2 degrees per decade, since 1988, it doubled, more than doubled. 
It's half a degree per decade, more than a half a degree per decade, comparing to one degree per century that we are talking of global warming. And by the way, these predictions were done by the models that the Mediterranean and the Middle East are going to be the most dramatically affected by global warming. So we've got something to verify in the future. Uh, can, can I just say a, a quick word? So no, because I would like to give, uh, uh, Michael Eason has been waiting for a while here. Sure, thank you very much. Can I thank the panel for adding clarity to the debate? <laughs> and uh, I, 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 I came here hoping that I would achieve clarity. And like Albert, I'm a great student of Karl Popper and the logic of scientific discovery and assessing theories on the basis of falsification and their heuristic power, their power to explain more than other theories. But maybe if we accept that there's a lot of uncertainty on the panel and there are nuances and some areas of agreement from the panel, it leads to this observation that we are to some degree in a position of making decisions in circumstances of deep uncertainty. Now, Rupert Murdoch once made a comment. I don't know whether climate change is right or wrong, but maybe we should take out the insurance, just in case. And so the question I would put to the panel, is that a reasonable position to adopt? And I know it's complex as to what the implications of that statement might mean, but what do you think it means to you? Thank you, Michael, and uh, may I direct you to an article of Henry Hergas, uh, who addresses that very eloquently, that he sent me a couple of days ago, and I, I really enjoyed that. He gave some, gives some uh, really great insights. Um, Nyasha Viv, would you like to answer this? Um, okay, so it's all a question about uh, risk assessment. Um, um, my short answer is that uh, uh, even if the problem was uh, grave, uh, I think there is a very clear solution to humanity, which, is, uh, which has a very small ecological uh, footprint, which uh, will give us very cheap uh, energy, uh, could be much cheaper than coal, in fact, and much safer than, uh, than anything else, and that's called uh, nuclear power. Uh, Fourth generation uh, nuclear power plants are going to be much safer than uh, anything uh, else. You can have things which are inherently safe um, and uh, you cannot have anything like Fukushima or uh, Chernobyl, which wasn't an accident. It was uh, an experiment that went uh, wrong uh, with an inherently unstable uh, nuclear power plant. You can build something which will have uh, which, uh, um, um, We'll have a nuclear waste with a half-life of no more than a century and a half uh, that could utilize much more of the uranium. It can be, give us everything for cheap. And I d really don't understand the, the mass hysteria that the world is now going over through when we have this solution waiting for us just to be picked up and adopted. I'm, I really don't understand it. The other thing is that uh, the way I see it, I studied the science for over 20 years, and I realized that the, the stories that we have been, we have been hearing are a, a grossly exaggerated. Um, the, the, the stories of, my, of the death of the Earth have been strongly exaggerated. Um, and a, the way I see it, it's not worthwhile to have... Uh, to ruin economies. Uh, nowadays, for example, uh, the price of electricity in Germany is two and a half times the cost of electricity uh, here or uh, in the US. And uh, in Australia, you're going in the same direction as, uh, as Germany. Um, I don't see... For a different reasons? Um, well, we, just, well, we, we don't have any nuclear in Germany. <laughs> I don't see... Uh, and they supply it to Germany as well. Exactly. Now they have to rely on French engineers as opposed to German engineers. <laughs> so let's get New Zealand to build nuclear power plants and steal I, it from them. 
and, uh, but but in Germany, industry you? is leaving Germany now because uh, because the, the price of energy is so high. So I don't see. I mean, it, it is a question of risk assessment. But the way I assessed it is that it's a um, it's too an expensive uh, thing to do. Right, and and I would also like to. I mean, this craze about wind and solar power, which have been going on for 30 years and currently supply around two percent of uh, uh, the world's electricity, or well, nuclear energy without any promotion is easily providing a, a more than double that. But uh, we have clear evidence from the great German experiment of the Energy Wende that wind and power, can, that wind uh, energy and solar energy just cannot power the continent. And I'm reading for you from the OECD Environment Working Paper number 139. And they say increasing the use, blah, 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 um, has uh, uh, resulted in two things. There was a, a, a significant increase in renewable energy quotas. Of course, they give subsidies to this. There was increase in installation of a, a, a renewable energy. But there was no robust effect in these factors on emissions. So is the... Is the is the, uh, are we just building uh, windmills just for the sake of building them? Or are we doing this to reduce emissions? And of course, I'm not sure reducing emissions is worth doing. But even if you take the, the, the idea that we must reduce emissions, we cannot, simply cannot do that by wind and solar energy. And we know and understand the engineering reasons for that. And it's extremely simple. And you don't need to be a theoretical physicist or an atmospheric scientist to understand that wind only uh, blows some of the time. And there is nowhere on Earth there's sun at night. Just nowhere. Thank you. I've checked. Moshe. So, the, the, uh, Sorry to interrupt you. No, no, no. This is fair enough. That's all I have to say. Moshe. No, the question really is uh, concerning what you asked, is uh, what we can do, given the, uh, there is a climate change, what we can do in the different governments, in the regional level, in the governmental level, in the state level, what we can do to mitigate it. And the issue begins with and the catastrophe is uh, caused by two real two factors really first of all population growth we have a huge population growth and and huge stress on natural resources the other thing is lack of management of natural resources by the states we see it also in israel we see it elsewhere everywhere around us we see it in india for example where uh, six, uh, 600 uh, million people are now uh, water stressed. We see it everywhere because of mismanagement of natural resources. The catastrophe also is happening. So climate change is just increasing the effect. But first of all, we are to blame uh, first, uh, by population growth and mismanagement. As for uh, the nuclear issue, it depends where you, you locate the nuclear plants. I mean, uh, it can be great, but uh, if you locate them, for example, near Alexandria, and Alexandria is supposed to sink, uh, according to all models by uh, 2050, then uh, it's not good. Or if you locate it in the shores of Bangladesh, which are also supposed to, to sink, it's also not good. So it depends where you locate them. I, I, I can just answer that. So there was a power plant located on the shores of a, a small town called Fukushima in Japan. In 2011, there was an earthquake about 60 miles off the shore, and the tsunami hit. You've all heard probably about the Fukushima accident. How many people died from that accident due to radiation? The answer is zero. That is completely true, and I can give you the reports. And the reason is that the amount of radiation on the fence of that uh, facility at the day of the disaster was about like having a mammogram, about three and a half millisievert per 20 hours. So this is a consideration, 
but it's a general consideration which has nothing to do with climate change. When you build a power plant, any power plant, you need to think about where to build it. You are correct. You need to manage your resources. And, of course, land and, and engineering, and these have to be managed. But has nothing to do with climate change. We need to follow the facts, ma'am. And the facts are that there were no deaths in Fukushima at all, while there were 16,000 dead from the tsunami itself. And nine people were exposed to a mammogram. Those are the statistics. No one will die from radiation in Fukushima. And, and as, as Nir correctly pointed out, uh, uh, we're going towards better nuclear reactors. So, of course, I, I totally agree with you that resources need to be managed. But this is a generally correct statement, which has nothing to do with climate change. Talking about nuclear, there is one question that really is burning me that I need to ask, um, because I never hear it uh, anywhere. I don't read about it, and so I don't know if it's ignored because my question is totally stupid. And it's possible that it is. It is possible. Um, in 1954, uh, there was the first atmospheric bomb that exploded in the Bikini Atoll in the South Pacific. It had a devastating effect well beyond the expectations of the scientists that were there at the time. I believe they all succumbed uh, following that. And the, the, uh, it was described that the region uh, that was affected by that first atmospheric bomb uh, was as large as the region between New York and Washington. And it devastated everything there, and I believe that for 100 years you cannot get uh, to that zone. And as, uh, subsequent to that, there were others by the Americans, by the Chinese, by the French, by the Russians, uh, by, the, by the Brits. Uh, I, I don't know. Has that got to do with uh, the way the climate is screwed up today? Pardon my French. So it's not taken into account in any studies? No. Okay, well, maybe that's something you have to look at. <laughs> no, the, I mean, <laughs> there is no way, known way that it can have a large effect. Uh, maybe there's an unknown way, but uh, people have never thought about anything like that. All right. Well, Tony Abbott, you wanted to ask a question. Are you sure? Jason. Uh, thanks very much. I, I, I guess a lot of us here don't know much about climate science, but we sure know a bit about political science. Uh, and I'm just curious as to uh, how this, um, let's call it the industrial climate change complex, has grown in relation to the level of funding allocated for climate science. And unfortunately, we have a situation in Australia where a very eminent highly responsible, very sensible uh, professor, Professor Peter Redd, was actually dismissed from his university, not by uh, dismissing and rejecting science, but by merely asking the question, should we continue to investigate the issues? And I think uh, it was related to the Great Barrier Reef. As a result of that, uh, he lost his position at James Cook University. Uh, back to Albert's point at the very beginning, we have a, now a generation of young people, uh, including my children, who are told that this aspect of science is over. What kind of effect are we having on not just uh, academ academia in terms of research, but also the next generation of academics, scientists, investors who believe that it's okay to call those of us who want to question and continue to explore a very complex system, not a complicated one, and we're labelled with all kinds of derogatory terms, but we are no less caring about our impact on the planet. There's not a single white person here if I ask you, are you against the planet? See, nobody. So I'd like to ask you, what can we do to realign the integrity of academia and science and politics around this debate for our future so we can actually get on and do something about it. I think we need another dialogue for that. <laughs> okay, and Tony, your question? 
like others, I'm not a scientist, uh, but I, I do have some comprehension of history and we know that there has been climate change in times past. The Ice Ages were an example of climate change. The Roman warm period was an example of climate change. The medieval warm period was an example of climate change. The mini ice age when the Thames froze over routinely was an example of climate change. None of these had anything to do with anthropogenic carbon dioxide. So the Romans were pretty some, powerful. What's that? The Romans were pretty powerful. <laughs> exactly right. But um, if, if something other than mankind's carbon dioxide emissions drove climate change then, why do we assume that the only thing or the main thing driving climate change today is mankind's carbon dioxide emissions? I will respond to that. <coughs> to your question about medieval climate anomalies, it's between 950 and 1250, temperatures were relatively high. And the IPCC, which is the UN a report, the recent report the, from 2013, they say about it the following, to differentiate it from what's happening now. With a high confidence, I'm quoting, with a high confidence, the medieval climate anomaly warming was not synchronous across region as the warming that we are seeing now from anthropogenic, which is due to the greenhouse gases. And the second statement from this report, the northern hemisphere temperature during recent decades from 1983 was very likely 90 to 100 percent, the warmest period in the last 800 years, and likely, which means 66 to 100 percent, the warmest over the 1,400 years. So there was a very different mechanism, and also related to what earlier we have heard, the warming of the 20th century between 1910 and 1940 was also due to a different reason. It was due to solar change in solar heating. While what we are seeing now is as Professor Kutz and the Nobel Prize winner said, it is an Anthropocene. We are in a period that we never had in the past that man is changing the climate. We are changing the climate. And it's not only CO2. It's all the feedbacks which go along. The other greenhouse gases, and particularly the water vapor. When you have warmer temperatures, you have more water vapor. In fact, something that we normally don't hear, the water vapor is the, is the greenhouse gas with the highest concentration in the atmosphere. Why isn't it mentioned? Because it exists naturally. But the CO2 also exists naturally, but we are increasing it much more, and it's causing the water vapor to increase by itself and double the warming. So, all these, all these factors should are taken into account in the models, of course, and bring us to a situation which is unprecedented in the past. And I don't agree with Nir about it. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, if you go back to Jurassic times, the world was much warmer than it is now. Yeah. Good you take a microphone? I mean, you may be right, Professor. Uh, perhaps the medieval warm period was a localised event. It was warm in Greenland, but it was cold everywhere else, maybe. But 
if you go back to Jurassic times, the whole globe was much hotter than it is now. If you go back to the Ice Age, the whole globe was much colder than it is now. Something made the climate hotter, something made the climate colder, and plainly, in those days, it wasn't mankind's carbon dioxide emissions. So if the world could be hotter and colder than it is now without any of man's influence, why do we assume that whatever is happening now must be primarily due to man's influence? That's my simple logical problem, not being... Okay, the larger the, the periods that we are talking about, glacial and interglacial changes, are due, as the IPCC explains, is due to what we know are the Milankovitch, the Milankovitch periods, which were explained in the 1930s by uh, Professor Milankovitch, looking into four parameters which have to do with the, with the Earth surrounding, uh, revolving around the Sun. There are four different parameters which cause fluctuations of the order of 100,000 years or 40,000 years which have to do with the, with the angle of the Earth axis compared to the sun and other like the eccentricity of them. So there are additional two parameters, four parameters which explain these glacial, interglacial variations. But we cannot explain these parameters of Milankovitch to explain what's happening now. The only valid theory is the greenhouse gases. The solar activity, it was shown in several, several publications that it's not explaining what is happening. No, it wasn't. Just okay, so I'm going to ask Yoni to uh, just ask, a, uh, answer this, and then we're going to wrap yeah, up. Just a quick comment. I'm just reading a paper right now. It says, a 2,000-year global temperature reconstruction based on non tree ring proxies, and it shows proxies. I mean, you cannot measure the temperature a 1,000 years ago, right? So you use proxies. These are measures, whatever measures, which correlate with temperature, and you can see those. This is just from the paper itself from 2008, and they're scattered all over the globe, and they all show the medieval warm period. So it was probably not local. And then one must ask, if this paper was out in 2008, why would the IPCC write something like that in 2013? And this goes back to the previous question about political sciences. <laughs> okay, well, if I may, uh, first of all, I would like to, to thank uh, Moshe, to thank you, Pinchas, to thank Sunir and uh, Yoni. And uh, would I, I would like to ask each and every one of you to say a few words to conclude. And uh, we're a little bit early, but why not? It's been a long day. Yoni, yes, we start with you. Thank you. So first, I'm very happy to be here, and I'm, I, I appreciate the invitation. We must look at the data. We cannot look at models. Models are not data. Models should be used to explain the data. <clears throat> and when considering a problem this large, which has so many steps in it, like is the temperature changing? Is it us? Is there a climate crisis? Is, is, is there something we could do? We must look at the data that we have available to us. That's it. Um, the thing I want to stress is that uh, you should not fall into the pitfall of uh, fallacious arguments. Uh, we are being brainwashed by things like the 97% uh, consensus, which even if it was correct, is irrelevant. Uh, we are being shown pictures of uh, stranded uh, polar bears uh, wherever. It's uh, not koala now. It's, uh, it's a koala stranded now. koala bear on an iceberg in, uh, it's, uh, in Alaska. We ran out of polar bear it's, pictures. It's irrelevant. Uh, first of all, it's wrong in the sense that uh, we have now more polar bears, uh, than, like four times as many polar bears today as there were in 1960. Um, and it's the first species ever to uh, enter the endangered uh, species list, even though it's doing much better than it did uh, decades uh, before. Um, and 
any, any, so a picture of a polar bear is not evidence that it's doing bad. It's not evidence that a specific polar bear is suffering. It's not evidence that there was warming. And even if it was evidence of warming, evidence of warming is not evidence of warming by humans. Okay, so as uh, my friend uh, Yoni said, we have to look at the data, and the data doesn't support the fact that the CO2 has a large effect on climate. Uh, actually, you have data that shows you the opposite, that CO2 uh, increases the temperature. If you double the amount of CO2, you will increase the temperature by anywhere between one and one and a half degrees, uh, which doesn't worry much. It doesn't worry me much, and it shouldn't worry you too much either especially given that we have this uh, clear solution on the table, which is nuclear power. <laughs> Talking about data, <laughs> I was dealing with data studying the global warming and additional effects uh, for many years, and I agree with you, but the data does not provide you what is going to happen in the future. So, you must rely on models. And all my debates and all my talks, I always start with the following sentence. I hope very much that all these predictions are going to fail. But unfortunately, I am very much worried. Look what happened even this winter in, this, in Israel. At the beginning of December, just one week ago, we were with 3.5% of the rainfall that is normally, uh, of the rainfall that we have uh, on the average in Israel, while on the normal at the beginning of December, a week ago, we were supposed to have about 20%, 30%. This wave of rainfall that we had last week brought us a little better, particularly in some region over central Israel. But we are still far from what we used to have. What is it? 15 December? We are very far. And the models... The models, the greenhouse gas models, the, the global warming models, they showed it 40 years ago. Jules Charney from MIT, 1969. It was shown there. So it happens. Look what happens around us. And, uh, I would like to continue your uh, thought and uh, say that uh, it depends on us, really on us, our, on our management, on population growth, whether those predictions will come true or not, uh, whether there is a catastrophe or not, this is depending on us. It doesn't depend on the climate change. It depends because climate change is, is just increasing uh, current problems that we have. Thank you very much, everyone. I'll see you at the gala dinner.